Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I don't know about you, but I find it sometimes hard to say thanks be to God after we hear scripture so boldly read. It's a challenge. But it is the summer blockbuster season, and movies full of action, adventure, thrillers, superheroes, Black Widows coming out this weekend, draw you back into the theaters after a long pandemic hiatus. Today, you might have thought we'd show you one of the Bible's top five blockbusters of all time. This passage does not stray far from the drama we like to see on the big screen. The gospel writer of Mark interrupts the narration of an essential chapter in Jesus' ministry with what seems to be a flashback that is itself a story of intrigue and shocking violence and a struggle between good and evil. It's a sordid tale of anger and revenge and resentment and death, super for a rainy July morning. Just before this story, though, Jesus has sent out his disciples to carry on this ministry with authority. They preach repentance. They call back people to a life that God intends. They heal the sick. They defeat evil. And that is good news and full of potential for this God-infused ministry into which Jesus calls the disciples. Fade to black. When the scene changes, Herod Antipas, Tetrarch of Galilee, enters. He is weak and reckless and quite unfit to hold power. The family connection here with this Herod is that he is the son of the famous and notorious Herod the Great, who we know was alive at the time of Jesus' birth. But this Herod ruled Galilee as a Roman client and reported to Emperor Tiberius. Herod Antipas appears nowhere else in the Gospel of Mark. But we get him today. Herod has married his brother's ex-wife against Jewish law. Not a very good idea for a leader whose power is already kind of fragile to publicly violate the law. John the baptizer has pointed this out, evidently kind of forcefully, and his wife does not like it. However, she has no formal power, and Herod apparently doesn't want to do anything more than imprison John. He's both fearful of John and intrigued by him at the same time. The power dynamic here with this triangle between Herod and his wife Herodias and John the Baptist, this triangle is epic. An opportunity arises, and Herodias, the wife, seizes on it. Now is her chance. Herod is so trapped by his ego and insecurity, by his power and weakness and foolishness, he publicly, openly, has given his word to his daughter, who is influenced by her mother, who just happens to have the same name. Bear with me. John's head is then delivered on a platter as the final course at Herod's birthday dinner. And later, John's disciples arrive and take his body for burial. That's the story. What does that have to do with us today? Well, maybe we know about feeling trapped or being caught in our own wrongdoing. Or maybe we can also be easily influenced by those who proclaim that they can bring us fame or money or power. Maybe we know what it's like to be called out, exposing our own weakness and feeling really vulnerable. Maybe we know how we can rage when we want to get sweet revenge 
and exploit another person for satisfaction or our own self-gain, regardless of the consequences? Well, years ago, the Washington Post quoted a lavishly paid lobbyist who said, there are only two engines that drive Washington. One is greed, the other is fear. And that's a fine description of what is happening at Herod's birthday party. This story highlights the themes that aren't just set in first century Galilee, but they are also brutal reminders of the powers of evil in our own world and in our own lives. Mark steps out of this demon-filled world that he's been sharing with us in the first five chapters of the Gospel of Mark and shows us real politics at work in the world. These are what the death-dealing forces look like in the context of the day. We see Herod's foolishness and his arrogance. We also see Herod's greed and his fear. What we also see is the dangerous character of John's witness and John's ministry in and around Galilee. He creates a level of disruption to the reigning political powers. We see the perennial clash between the imperial, the empire, the power that seeks to personalize gain through exploitation and the power to restore and to heal and to proclaim the good news of repentance. They clash like a great blockbuster does. John's message is pretty clear though, that there is conflict between the way God's realm is supposed to work and the empire is working. Upsetting that kind of power comes with consequences. God's agents most certainly will suffer death. Now we know that neither John nor Jesus shirks at that message or responsibility even unto death. But Herod here, his pledge to his daughter offering up half of the kingdom, which is not even his to grant, is an arrogant boast meant to impress the other elites in attendance. Such irresponsible use of power is his undoing, for the preservation of his honor prevents him from breaking that promise. And killing John reveals him as a thug, a thug who eliminates God's prophet, even though he knew John would be a righteous and holy man. Well, Herod has backed himself into a corner, and he doesn't have the moral courage to do the right thing. He exposes himself as a man with no control over himself or his words or his power or his household or maybe even the kingdom that he thinks he's leading. Herod allows the empire to shape his values and shape his decisions. Greed and fear are the powerful engines in the story. They are also powerful engines in our world today. The terrible thing is that we might not even be so shocked at this story that we read this morning because we are inundated with all of the political and economic powers at all levels, making promises and leaving dysfunction in their wake. But what happens when we honor the wrong people? Rome chose this pompous leader to govern Galilee, and he represents a culture fueled by power and privilege that will do anything to extend its capacity to pursue its own desires, to hold on to power, to trumpet its own self-importance, eliminate criticism, and resist the justice and peace that God longs to bring to fruition. John does what he has been doing all along, and that is calling for repentance. It's the story that illustrates what it looks like when corruption and pride make repentance impossible. So you may wonder why Mark is here today giving us the story. 
It's not only a tale in which Jesus never really appears. Its villains never reappear in the Gospel of Mark. It's a strange story about John in which the baptizer himself never appears until really the last scene. Mark records the story of John not simply to direct us to a future hope, but also to remind us that faithfulness to God often costs something in the very present. And we know where faithfulness to God will lead Jesus. Friends, it is hard to find good news in this text today. But thank you for coming and working with it with me. It is really hard. Everywhere where greed and fear are whispering, in Herod's ear, among Galilee's high and mighty, behind the curtain between the mother and the daughter, even in the dungeon prison. Maybe Herod is the representative of the kind of moral bankruptcy that festers inside of human societies and corporations and families and institutions, and we probably better take a look at them. Well, because of John's death, Jesus' disciples, their mission now looks much more dangerous, doesn't it? In calling people to repent, they may be walking on dangerous ground. A prophet's work has always been like that. Speaking truth to power requires more than just one voice. It requires more than one voice. It requires a collective effort to speak the truth in love. It involves the whole community. And so where might we find good news? So let me leave you with this. Herod's banquet, his birthday banquet, is not the only banquet in this chapter. So I encourage you to read the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. Read a little further, or join us again next week and hear it again. Herod's horrible banquet runs right into the story where Jesus makes sure that everyone is fed. On a hillside, crammed together with five loaves of bread and two fish. Mark wants to make sure that we hear the story of the banquet of death, followed closely by this banquet of abundance and grace. Jesus is the one who hosts that banquet. In the middle of nowhere, where thousands of nobodies with nothing to offer except five loaves and two fish. And at that feast, at that feast, greed and fear have no place. And there, all who are there are fed with leftovers beyond comprehension. That, my friends, will keep us going for the good news. Thanks be to God.